Hi folks, Irish Trekkie back again with another Nerd Escape podcast and as always I'm joined with Chris the Trek Collector. Hi guys, great to see you back again. And myself and Chris are delighted to welcome Rick Stern back to the podcast. We are two very happy Trekkies here. Welcome Chris, or welcome Rick. <laughs> hey great, thanks, to, uh, thanks for having me absolute pleasure i know when i said it to chris that i was looking to get you on uh the two of us had a ferocious conversation about how excited we would be wouldn't we chris <laughs> oh yes absolutely absolutely and you have a great history in star trek it's 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 amazing um and i think what we're going to do is you started off in the motion picture i i did i did i i i i I mean, it's a very, very long story that I've told a few times. Uh, uh, you know, I met I met up with Gene Roddenberry back in uh, Connecticut, where I was living, in 1974. And uh, 1976, uh, I got to see Ralph McQuarrie's artwork for Star Wars uh, before the film ever came out and thought, oh, my goodness, maybe I could do this sort of stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, d did a very crazy thing and moved from, uh, you know, Connecticut to, uh, California, um, uh, and met with the folks at Paramount Pictures who were doing Star Trek, the second five-year mission of the Enterprise. Uh, they were calling it phase two back then. Um, and, uh, you know, it was supposed to be a TV series, but Star Wars got released and Paramount decided, you know, we're going to do this as a feature. Uh, and uh, Joe Jennings, the uh, production designer for that, that uh, you know, supposed TV series, became the production designer for the feature film. And he, you know, he called me in, uh, you know, after months. Uh, you know, I had left my samples, my business card, and... Uh, he called and said, you know, they're announcing the feature. You want to come in? And wow. that, that's where I started. I, that, that's where I got to meet all the folks who were trying to get Star Trek back onto, uh, onto some kind of screen. I, it's, it's actually so funny because when you look at it now, that, that's your story there. And it's been an absence of Star Trek on the TV screen. And you come back into 2017 and you look where Discovery's going, and they're going back to the Ralph kind of design. And like to me, I know at first it was kind of like, Ugh, but to me it makes sense because you have to dress it up for 2017. And how do you get away from the excuse of not copying the sets from the original Enterprise and stuff like that? You need to have something different. So it's just so funny how everything goes around in a big circle. Yeah, yeah, we'll have to, we'll have to see what they come up with. Yeah, we're looking forward to that. So obviously you had a great experience on the motion picture because i know i remember reading a part with yourself that you were kind of in a car and you heard that they were going to do star trek the next generation mm -hmm. tell us the story on that one. Oh yeah oh, yeah yeah uh, well I, you know i uh, after after the motion picture uh you know i got involved with a bunch of other uh projects uh you know including uh, uh the uh, cosmos miniseries with carl sagan right after the motion picture um and uh you know 1986 comes along and uh i'm driving home on one of the you know la freeways and the radio says paramount pictures announces star trek the next generation and 20 seconds later i was at a payphone <laughs> <laughs> you know we didn't have cell phones I didn't have a cell phone. I didn't have a car phone, you know. <laughs> um, so within 20 seconds, I was at a gas station and uh, I called. Uh, I called the studio. Uh, Susan Sackett, who was uh, 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 Gene's assistant, uh, she said, "Look, don't worry. The phone's been ringing off the hook. Uh, you know, Gene will want to see you. You know, just just hang in there." Um, so you know, it, it it took a little while, but they, you know, they were. We're starting to, to, you know, bring people in. Uh, and, um, you know, I got, I got to meet up again with uh, 
uh, you know, David Gerald, who I, you know, known for, for some years before that, and Dorothy Fontana, and uh, met Bob Justman, producer, uh, for the first time, and left my portfolio with, with Bob. And, uh, you know, it was, it was just a very nice uh, initial meeting. A couple of months went by, and, you know, I got pulled in right after uh, Andy Probert. Yeah, because the two U's were the first two managers hired for the production, which is is incredible. And to think as well that we had Star Trek, a can, three and four, which a lot of people do kind of class as one big movie. And you didn't work on that. So you obviously made yeah. a great impression on the motion picture. That bang, you know what I mean? You were one of the first to get hired for the next generation. And as a fan and as I love your work, you know, I was delighted um, <laughs> with all the contributions that you have done throughout the next generation and so forth, Deep Space Nine and Voyager. So to me, well, you, know, it, you know, uh, people like like uh, like Gene Roddenberry and, you know, uh, Bob Jessman, uh, to me, they were very, you know, old school. They understood uh, the, uh, you know, the art requirements, the tech requirements, um, um, you know, and uh, uh, I, I just can't, you know, thank them enough again and again for, you know, uh, believing in us as artists who were also into science fiction, uh, space technology, um, you know, all the sciences. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we got it. We understood, you know, what was involved in, in um, you know, getting the Star Trek concepts uh, together, um, you know, ships and props and, and, uh, uh, you know, eventually, you know, giving them tech notes on, on things that, you know, maybe they weren't fully, uh, um, you know, maybe they weren't, weren't fully aware of certain scientific concepts. So, you know, we, we very nicely, you know, offered, uh, to give them a few notes. Yeah, and like, the, like I was just going to say the, there, Chris. Phrase, techno bubble. <laughs> techno bubble. Yeah. Oh, I, I don't don't even give me that word. Don't even say that word in my presence. Uh, I, you know, strike I strike that from the record. It's, <laughs> it's only babble if it makes no sense. Yeah. Okay. We didn't make no sense. We we tried to make as much sense as possible, and you know, and the writers could could use whatever bits and pieces. Um, you know, they wanted, but we were at least trying to give them, you know, smart, interesting science. Um, you know, a lot of what was happening on Next Generation, um, you know, that, that we were taking from the real world. Um, mm. You know, so many things were happening in computing and material science and uh, industrial processes and all this sort of thing. Uh, so, Star Trek and, you know, super science and super tech were, were kind of growing up at the same time, you know, and, and we just loved it. So we, we tried to pull in, you know, a lot of real interesting stuff, uh, you know, to, to hand off to, uh, you know, to the higher ups. And like that, that's a massive thing, you know, again, with Star Trek being science fiction. And it's a credit to all the work that you folks put into it and the writers as well, because like looking back retrospectively on Star Trek, um, because you were building your the universe around frontier science as well, you know, a lot of technologies that were in the show, we have the luxury of having now or the theories have just gotten stronger and like more competent about propulsion and computing and and everything sure. like that as well. It's just amazing. I love science fantasy, don't get me wrong, but science mm -hmm. fiction, that's 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 my big thing yeah. really. And it's just, yeah. it's an amazing thing to have just so deeply woven into all of Star Trek from the original series yeah. right up to present day as well. Absolutely right. outstanding. And, and Great thing with the script writers as well, I do love, and as, as you said there, Rick, I know you hate the word techno, but, but I like the way that the script writers worked so well. That, like when they were writing scripts, they go, this is techno babble, and they would give this part off to the likes of yourselves and the likes of the scientists to actually, okay, try and describe what you're trying to do. Okay, 
give us a minute, we'll come back. This is what you should describe it as. Yeah. And from science fiction, a bit of science fact coming in there, which is, that made Star Trek The Next Generation. I think it's evident. It wasn't just one of these where a script writer could write up something crazy and that was it. And that, mm -hmm. that's the beauty of Star Trek, which I think yeah. is yeah. absolutely fantastic. Right. I, I mean, you know, we like Michael Cooter and myself, we didn't want to beat the viewers over the head with the stuff. Hmm. Uh, but we wanted to, to at least give the writers, you know, little nuggets of, you know, stuff that that was either real science or could be plausible extensions of what we know now. OK, we don't have faster than light travel. But within Star Trek, we wanted to, to set up a, a, a system uh, that, you know, could remain consistent, could sound plausible, mm. and that, you know, you know, the viewers could understand week after week after week, okay? You got impulse, you got warp, you know, you've got, uh, you know, attitude control. Uh, you got shields, you know, so we, we, we tried to nail these things and if they wanted something to break, fine, <laughs> you know, <laughs> they could write in something to go haywire, uh, and we could help out with that too. But you can see how hungry the fans were as well for it because with, with yourself and Mike working on the technical manual, you know, like, uh, I don't know how many other franchises would have warranted the creation of that and i know like the writers used a wealth of information from that as well but it's just mm -hmm. it, it just you can see how it resonates that we have these fantastical stories but grounded in a believable universe as well and it's just it's endured so long and um it, it's just it has created this fantastic kind of fingerprint of star trek that i think since your involvement in tng because i know a lot of the team because star trek no matter who we talk to, be it yourself or John Eves or anybody in, involved, it's a massive collaborative uh, venture. And mm -hmm. the group of people that worked on TNG and D Space Nine and Voyager, they kind of spread themselves out over there so we can see it kind of evolving and maturing in front of our eyes over the, this, the several decades that followed as well. But um, like with your involvement in TNG, there's some absolutely stellar kind of bringing it back to ships like you worked on some amazing ships um for example i know we wanted to talk about uh, the enterprise c for example um we've andy probert's initial concepts and then we we see the enterprise in front of our eyes as well like what what was that like working on the enterprise c well it, it was a it was a bit of a a, a crazy rush because of you know episodic television schedules and mm. and, uh, and that sort of thing um you know um you know some of uh, some of the the initial color sketches that uh, that uh, uh andy perbert did um uh, you know might have taken an inordinate amount of time to to make as a miniature on the episodic schedule mm. okay uh, so I tried to simplify a lot of the shapes. Uh, Greg Jean and his minions built the C, built the miniature. Uh, and, uh, you know, instead of an elliptical saucer, uh, you know, I went with a circular saucer. Okay. Hmm. Uh, all right. You know, if, if we're talking about a, a halfway point stylistically between the B and the D, hmm. uh, okay, the B, you know, the Excelsior class uh you know had a circular saucer i didn't feel too bad about making the c with it with a circular saucer too um you know straightened up a few shapes um got the blueprints you know out the door and you know greg built the model um you know i i i think it was a valid um you know a, a valid uh, uh, uh step in the lineage um, and, you know, the, the revised or, you know, or Andy Probert's original idea for the C, you know, eventually got turned into a gorgeous CGI model. Mm. You know, it's a wonderful, you know, it's also a wonderful, valid design. Uh, but, you know, within the, 
realities of production, you know, we had to make some changes. Um, I like, you know, I like what what the C turned out to be, um, you know, within yesterday's enterprise. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you, you know, it, it was one of these these things where you wipe your brow and you say, phew, we got it done. <laughs> yeah. It was it was funny to watch that episode because I know, again, like you had Andy's, you know, it, it was in the ready room and you kind of. But you did so well with the, the enterprise. You're there, like, yeah, I'm not even gonna nitpick on that. But it's so funny as well that, like, with the, with a TV production that you have to do, like, you even go back to Matt Jeffries in TOS with his original shuttle concept, that mm -hmm. it was just too elaborate to build, and they had to simplify it. And it's just, you you know, I I think the Enterprise C, like that whole episode yesterday's Enterprise, just when you see it, you're just like, you're blown away, and it's. You, it, 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 it's great when you kind of go back and rewatch stuff and then you start understanding the process that you guys were under the pressure like to build Andy's version of the sea probably would have probably taken you probably a month or two and you had what probably oh. two weeks to get this show done yeah yeah I, and, and, and this sort of thing you know has cropped up before where we have to think on our feet mm. um, you know I've had to, to knock out crazy doodles on script pages and hold them up at production meetings and say, is this what you're looking for? Like you the know? Type 15 shuttle. <laughs> huh? Like the Type 15 shuttle. <laughs> uh, like the, yeah, like the shuttle pod. Yeah. Um, you know, we almost didn't get to to build a shuttle. Uh, you know, it's a, it, it's another, it's just another example of, of you know, having to, to pull you know, pull a, a, a situation out of the fire and, mm. and make it work. Uh, a, a lot of times, you know, the, the audience just never gets to hear about it. They yeah. never see, you know, the crazy, you know, the hair pulling um, in, in the background. Um, you know, I've, I've done, I've done, you know, back of the envelope doodles yeah. uh, for some of our, our visual effects supervisors. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, and just say, look, okay, I think this will work. Takes us to the CGI guys, and you know, and see what they can do with it. And then it's <clears throat> then it's on to the next episode. The the, the 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 furious development of TV, and like it's one thing that I never really, and kind of like what you touched on there, Rick, as a viewer. It, it just completely is oblivious to you. You're just seeing these episodes being presented and you're like, oh, why did they do that? And there's the reality behind it. Um, I remember, Chris will remember this as well, talking to John Eves and we were talking about the Enterprise E and he's like, I liked it long. And we were comparing it to the Enterprise D and he said, the reason it was so stubby was because of the four by three aspect of uh, broadcast television. And it's something I never thought about when you're looking at like cinematic releases on a... On a, on a yeah over 16 uh, by 9 and it's just amazing but um i remember seeing some of your doodles like th there's some great sheets of yours in the eagle moss collection where you'll see the development of shuttlecraft as well and i remember seeing the doodle for one of it'll always resonate as one of the best villain ships in my opinion the vorcha uh, i remember the first time seeing that face down the enterprise d and i was like that's something different. That the bold color and just the aggressive nature of it as well. Um, Chris maybe the same as well. But like, what what was working on the Vorcha like as well? Again, like we have the Klingons, synonymous baddies of uh, the Star Trek as well. Absolutely amazing. The the, the Vorcha was was just a you know it, it was just a great opportunity to uh, come up with a, a new main ship. Um, you, you know I. Um, you know, eventually I would do a, a big ship, you know, Voyager. Uh, but during TNG, you know, doing the uh, d doing the, the Klingon attack crews in the Vorcha class uh, was just, you know, it was one of these things where I just, you know, rub my hands together and say, ooh, I'm going to get started on this one. <laughs> um, you know, you, you, we, you know, we talk about the doodles a bit. My, my doodles are very often indecipherable. Uh, <laughs> but I know what I'm looking at. Um, and I will eventually get into more, you know, cleaner sketches, um, you know, some some rough uh, CGI shapes that I can trace over. Okay, and uh, 
you know, we we had uh, you know we had Matt Jeffrey's original Battle Cruiser. Mm. Uh, we've had some variations on the Battle Cruiser for the feature films, um, and uh, you know I wanted to 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 maybe evolve the shapes a little bit, um, you know, but still keeping some of those stylistic bits uh, that that say Klingon. Okay, you know mm. uh, that 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 go back to what Matt Jeffries so beautifully did uh, for for TOS. Uh, and, uh, you know, add a few more details, add a few more bits and pieces. Uh, you know, um, I, I, I love putting the big disruptor on the nose. Um, yeah. you know, very, very Japanese anime inspired weapon. <laughs> um, uh, and, you know, and I liked working out a lot of the bits and pieces, like things like, uh, um, you know, cargo doors and radiator blocks and, Maybe some aft firing disruptors, uh, things like that. So, you know, you get into, uh, you know, one area of the, of the 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 ship, and suddenly, you, you know, I find myself just just drawing tiny little bits and pieces and shapes. Most people will never understand what they are, but I know. I put them in the drawings. You know, Greg Jean built the 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 miniature, um, and. Uh, you know, I, I, I even put together a, a sheet of uh, uh, where light effects could come out of the ship. Uh, where do you, where do you fire the disruptors from? Well, very specific spots. You can't just have you know beams flying from anywhere. Um, you know, torpedo launcher uh, in the tail, the big disruptor in the front. Um, you know, where are the uh, uh, you know, where are the main deflectors for the ship? Things like that. So again, you know, this goes back to the science and technology. Um, it's it's alien. It's Klingon, but it also, to me, has to make a certain amount of sense. You know, mm. because if you see it again and again, you know, in the episodes, you'll understand, oh, that little yellow block on the hull, that's the disruptor. Okay? Mm. Things like that. Um, and, and I just had, I just had a ball, you know, evolving the shape and then finally, uh, uh, doing the very detailed pen, uh, pen and ink drawings, uh, and, uh, drawing up, um, what, what I would call very shorthand, um, blueprints, you know, the basic shapes, uh, for, for Greg Jean to follow, um, and uh, all of the the whole plating, all of the uh, the very Klingon, angular, you know, armor plates, uh, you know, uh, you know, he could see those in the in the sketches. Great. The, the Vorcha to me, Rick, was absolutely fantastic because it was like we hadn't really seen a proper Klingon battle cruiser in a long time. The contingent was kind of very D seven, but you managed to do the D seven cross with a bird of prey like even that disrupt at the front <laughs> you know what i mean it's it just worked so it, like straight away when you're seeing it if you had no klingons no one you could nearly be 99 percent sure that has to be a klingon ship it screamed klingon and as damien said you, you, you you'll never forget that yeah. scene with the enterprise unlike the romulan bird of prey which was massive but like you had that scene yeah. with the vulture and the enterprise d head to head and you're like whoa but it, it, you did an absolute amazing job yeah. on that ship well, thank, no, you. thank you. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, but you know, now, now you say you say it. You know, it, it screams Klingon. I think it it more shouts Klingon. Um, <laughs> you know, especially because of the uh, uh, the less aggressive paint scheme uh, on the Vorcha, uh, which I thought would be you know sort of a detente kind of color, halfway between. The dark green, you know, the dark olive drab green and uh, the Enterprise bluish gray. Mm. Okay, somewhere in between. Okay, because of the the warming relations between the Empire and the Federation. Okay, uh, and I, I've told folks, you know, I think if there was a Klingon commander, uh, you know, putting in his order for a new ship at the shipyards. He would go back to that that dark color scheme, you know, 
you know, none of this, none of this pale blue, greeny, teal color. You know, I want something really tough. I, I don't want to go for the soft, soft Klingon green. I want to go for the. <laughs> yeah, and I, I've seen some modelers take the uh, uh, take the AMT kit and do it up in a dark pattern, and it looks fabulous. I'd say it would. I'd say it absolutely would. And like, I, we could probably dedicate the whole podcast to TNG alone, just with the wealth. But just to kind of before we kind of move on to D Space Nine, um, have you like a favorite ship or even like shuttle craft or even? prop because we don't often talk about it as well but um you know there's some absolutely amazing props being designed by by everyone involved in the art department as well but is there one special item there that you don't often talk about or something that kind of resonates with you in with your work in tng you know i i looked at a chart i looked at a chart of star trek ships lately and i think i've done like 50 of them (laughs) so it's you know aside from aside from some some obvious favorites like voyager or or the vorcha uh i i think one of my uh, one of my other favorite ships is the uh the cardassian galore class cruiser Mm. it was another style that uh you know you you know you, you you could look at the galore class and say oh that's cardassian Okay, and then, mm. and that's that's my whole that's my whole mission is is to you know come up with a a, a look uh, that you can't confuse with with other cultures, you know. So I the Gaylor I think uh, you know was was uh, a, you know a very a very cool uh, style. It doesn't it doesn't marry up exactly with the Deep Space Nine space station style. Hmm. but sort of kind of um and i think in terms of props um you know aside from the 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 very visible um uh, uh things like the tricorder okay yeah. i i have a i have a real soft spot for the hypo spray oh yeah cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. i mean there's, there are a lot of things about the hypo spray we've never explored really Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's got some buttons on it. What do they do exactly? Um, you know, you have these ampules that that stick up into the unit, um, and I think most people by now know that that my inspiration for the hypo spray was the asthma inhaler that I had to use ages ago. Oh uh, okay? yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just turned it up. I turned it over, and I said. Oh my God! This this could work as the hypo. Eureka! <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, and again, you know, with with the little moving parts like the the medicine ampules. Okay, mm-hmm. uh, you want to give the actor some business. You want to give them something to do with the prop. Okay, um, you know, with with things like the medical tricorder. Yes, you had the little detachable sensor. Yeah. Um, and lots of buttons to push. Okay. With the hypo, you had the ampule. Um, I, I think in some cases, the ampule may simply be a carrier fluid. And a lot of the pre installed medicine is already in the hypo. Okay. And mm. when you're hitting the buttons on the hypo, you're setting up the dosage and you're setting up exactly what kind of medicine. Um, you know, I could probably write, uh, you know, five or six pages just about the hypo. Um, hmm. But the fact that you, you, you saw, you know, Beverly Crusher using it on the ship yeah. or using it on an away mission. Um, and you got to understand, again, you know, again, <clears throat> you saw it week after week. And she simply jammed the ampule in, shot, you know, shot the patient in the neck. Yeah. Um, and you knew what it was, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> so, you know, that's fine. Anything else you want to do with it, you know, that's that's extra. You know, that's that's uh, that's gravy. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> interesting, interesting. Very good to know. And like just just kind of wrapping up there. Interesting that you picked the Cardassian ship as well, because again, that was like the first time we saw them. And then again, obviously, we have D Space Nine, and then we have the Hideki class, the Keldon as well. So we have mm-hmm. we have the Galore being like the Genesis, the the, the DNA, and it's just great to see it evolve. Then yeah, it was and a good starting. Work on it. it's a good starting point. Yeah. Mm. Did you find um, like with TNG when when the Cardassians came into? I know I think it was John that said that like with Michael Kuda he do the alien logos and stuff like that, and he kind of got inspired by say the Cardassian symbol, and that's where he'd kind of initially take drawings out. Did you find that like when you're in TNG, then to move to Deep Space Nine, designing Deep Space Nine, that that kind of all helped to fit in? Well, I mean, you know, we bounced a lot of ideas back and forth amongst ourselves. Uh, you know, I, uh, uh, like Mike and I had had done just a pile of, of you know, early designs for the station uh, that weren't really going anywhere. Mm. Uh, but, you know, we had to try different things, see what the producers were, were responding to. Uh, you know, I, and I, I think most people know that that the initial concept for the station uh, was an abandoned alien structure that the Cardassians commandeered. Okay, that went out the door. Um, but we just continued, you know, listening to, to, to the ideas that the producers had um, and trying to make it work in, you know, a, a, a design that, that could be built as a miniature um and and filmed without a lot of hassle um you know and and it was a few months process um of going from an oil platform in space uh to a big you know sort of tall spindly uh looking structure um you know and eventually it came around to the um, you know the big the big circular rings mm. uh, central core and um, and the pylons which had originally started out as these these big continuous hoops and Rick yeah. Berman said well break the hoops <laughs> 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 and so, you know I you know I don't mind an an outside influence saying well why don't you just you know, do that. And, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, you know, sometimes you get a little too too close to things, you know, and, and uh, we have to, we have to oh, do something different. When you bring up, like, practical filming, because, like, CGI was starting to come into it, but with Deep Space Nine, you were still using practical models. It's actually, mm-hmm. now that you say it, when you do look at Deep Space Nine, obviously... You know, if you're filming a model, that's obviously it's it's a beautiful design because you've the upper pylons for larger ships, you've like the outer docking bays that you know, and then it, as well for the runabouts. And so it's so well, it's so camera friendly, and like to me as well, I I, I always, you know, when you see these guys, I'm like, this is so alien, and you could see the Cardassian influence in Deep Space Nine, but I remember I was building an AMT. Uh, Deep Space Nine model at the time and they went to go with the paint scheme and believe it or not it was the kind of the brownish colour of the Cardassian ships and I, I painted it <laughs> and it looked very Cardassian I was there like nah I have to paint that grey <laughs> 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 it, it's it, I, to me it's wonderful but now that you said that part about just being practical and filming because I think that's one of the one things that you do really like and I think some of the great visuals when you do look back in Deep Space Nine, one of the first ones is the likes of the Enterprise docked on the upper pylon, and you get that lovely view of the Enterprise D, and just yeah. this this huge space. Like I know the, the bicycle wheel, but it just I know it's just something that I I actually really really love, and I, it's that it, like everyone says Starship is a character, but Deep Space Nine itself was such a beautiful character, and even when it came to life in season four when all of a sudden the the weapons platform started coming out and all yeah. this you went wow <laughs> the way of the world you know, yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah i mean you know our uh even before the miniatures were finished okay you know the the visual effects uh gang um 
uh, you know, including uh, our, our late friend uh, Gary Hudsell. Uh, you know, the visual effects folks would, would make uh, foam core uh, mock-ups, uh, you know, so that they could, uh, uh, you know, get the, the track, uh, you know, get the camera and the track programmed. Uh, for when the you know when they they brought the the real finished miniatures in, uh, mm. and uh, you know once the once the drawings left my table, okay, uh, you know a lot of the real magic happened. Uh, Tony Meininger and Brazil Fabrication, you know they built this wonderful miniature. It's six feet across. Uh, they built um, you know enlarged sections for filming. Mm. Uh, you know, an enlarged runabout pad, uh, you know, a partial ring so that they could actually get the camera past certain obstructions. Uh, and, uh, you know, that that aspect of it to, to me was was just fascinating. Uh, you know, oh, you build another, you know, one third of the station so that you could actually get the camera in there. You know, yeah. I thought that was just, you know, astounding. It was a brilliant move. Um, I, 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 I have one, one sketch of the completed station where uh, a number of us were standing around wondering, okay, how are we going to mount this thing? Um, and uh, uh, it turned out that, that a, a, a three-pronged mount, uh, one peg into each pylon, uh, you know, would hold it, would hold it beautifully, uh, and even upside down. So, the, you know, since the, the upper pylons and the lower pylons were, were simply copies of each other, mm. uh, they were able to put fixtures into the tops and bottoms of this thing, uh, and, uh, you know, mounted on a special, a special dolly. Uh, and, and, you know, again, this is all, while CGI was starting to get really good, um, you know, we still had to film miniatures and we still had yeah. to design them so that we could accommodate mounts. Um, mm. You know, things like uh, the things like the uh, uh, Cardassian cruiser. Um, you know, we had to we had to accommodate like a half inch steel rod. Uh, in the back, in the side, in the bottom, uh, same same with Voyager, okay? Um, you know, spaceships today, okay, you don't normally need to, to worry about mounts, and you can have parts that articulate like crazy and spew fire, and, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, it's a whole different world now. One, one of the, obviously... CG has, has really become the dominant thing. But one of the things I liked about D Space Nine, because um, it was such a bold thing to do in Star Trek, we always had like a ship and it was always moving, but the, and here we have a station. But D Space Nine had some fantastic sets, the command section, promenade, and, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. But you could so easily see on the model, there's the promenade. Mm -hmm. There, there's, there's the, 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 the core room that we saw in Impact Noor and like, okay, they're looking out that window from the ring. It was, it was amazing to see because like we have the fantastic, you know, Earth space dock and uh, the lovely Federation ships and you can see some of the key locations, but you know, okay, where's that person's room or where's that person's room and so on and so forth. But D Space Nine, it was just so clear and it just it married yep. so well with the production sets yep. as well as fantastic exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah um i mean i was uh, you know uh i i worked on maybe the first you know three or four uh seasons of, of ds9 before they they booted me back to work on voyager full time um uh, but I, I i i felt so privileged to be able to to you know become sort of the lead designer on the station miniature and uh uh, I, you know, I, I love the idea of being able to, to, you know, um, you know, put a, a set shape, a sh you know, like, 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 um, let's say Cisco's office had that big window. Yeah. Well, you got to put that on the outside, you know, the promenade windows, same thing. 
so, you know, I was constantly looking at what the set designers were doing, what Herman Zimmerman as production designer and his set designers were, were drafting for the mill to construct for real. Okay. I, I made as, you know, as close as I could, I, I made those shapes on the blueprints, uh, for, for Tony Meininger's guys. Um, and, uh, you know, I, but I would also write notes, please see set blueprints for final shape. <laughs> you know, yeah, and, and I uh, want read, yeah, and, read and, well. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Tony Meininger and, and his guys just, I mean, they did the most amazing job of, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, taking the, 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 um, taking the input from the sets and putting it into the miniature. I mean, you know, yes, mm. in, in some cases we're looking at, at things that were, they were only like a half inch across. Um, but you could see, uh, you know, especially from the way the, the VFX guys filmed the miniature. Okay. Yeah. Pushing on, you know, pushing on ops, uh, pushing on the habitat ring, uh, and then cut to, you know, people walking down the corridor, you know, those sorts of moves, you know, really, it, they, they just wrapped everything up in, in a, in a gorgeous package. Mm. Uh, so again, week after week, the viewers could understand, oh yeah, ops is upstairs. There's Cisco's window. Yeah. Um, you, you know, people walking around inside the promenade. Um, you know, I, it, Perfect you know, package. It's just a great bit of history. <laughs> you know? And then out, out, out from D Space Nine, we mentioned it a bit earlier as well. We have one of my favorites. And like I, I like to always call it the workhorse of the Federation. We have the runabout, you know, just. Yep. <laughs> and like, OK, we're talking about starships here and space stations, but this yep. this little support ship, I say a little, but she's got a soft spot for me. Like, uh, it's it's just an amazing ship. Can, can you tell us a bit about yep. the runabout? Well, the runabout, you know, um, I, I again, you know, we could have uh, we could have found ourselves using an existing miniature, uh, the executive shuttle from, from Trek six. Mm. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the producers in their, in their infinite wisdom decided, no, we need something brand new. But I, you know, the, if you look at the lineage between the Galileo, the executive shuttle and up to the runabout, um, with the runabout sketches, I really wanted to include you know, some little signature bits. <clears throat> um, so from the executive shuttle, yes, I borrowed some, uh, some wingtip uh, lift engines and that sort of thing. Um, Jim Martin in the DS9 art department contributed a ton of exterior details. Um, and I just, I just drew variations on this small ship uh, with the one constant being the cockpit, which the set designers had already <laughs> started drawing. Um, so once the cockpit, you know, the forward windows and the side windows, the little capsule shaped windows, yeah. uh, and the entry door, once those elements were nailed, I couldn't change them. Okay. But I worked around them. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, we had the, uh, the aft lounge area. Uh, we, uh, we had a, a, um, a swappable, like a cargo module that, um, uh, Jim Martin dreamt up he said, you know, why not, why not break this thing into, uh, swappable pieces. Mm. Okay. So the cockpit is actually like an escape craft, but we never saw it used that way. Okay. Uh, it could detach in, in, you know, in case of a warp core breach, oh, cool. <laughs> you know, Ever. As uh, as a little escape craft, okay. You mm. slam the door shut. Everybody piles into the cockpit, you know. And and if the writers wanted to, they could have used it as an escape craft. No, oh, yeah, because I, I can know. actually see the, the lines and everything's there. Because I know it's yeah, like the cockpit's one, and then you have the cargo module, and then it's the the warp sled, as as, as you yeah. call it. So 
from there, so, literally from that part there, it could just eject. Makes right, a lot of sense. Yeah. So, Brilliant. you know, as, as, as we did with Deep Space Nine, okay, I, I took a lot of input from a lot of different people. Um, and on the runabout, um, you know, just started finalizing the, uh, the blueprint. Uh, mm. And uh, uh, Tony Meininger's guys did the runabout um, uh, miniature, about 18 inches long. And I got to say that they nailed it to within like an eighth of an inch of the blueprints. Wow. You know, that's, that's how, how perfect that thing turned out. Amazing. Uh, yeah. Yeah.